Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Welcome to another exciting episode of Helming Your Way Through Strange Waters, an introduction to the Kubernetes world. Once again, I'll be your navigator. My name is Christopher Lillian Stolfi. I'm a, a senior director of product management and architecture for cloud native and container infrastructure and networking here at Cisco. You probably, hopefully, have seen some of the other episodes. This is that we that I've gone through already. If not, they're available on YouTube. This will be the last episode of the, say, 100 level course. Before this, some of the other ones um, built on why is this important as far as an industry move? What are containers? Are they different from VMs, et cetera, et cetera. Those would probably be useful to get to see before you see this one. Uh, so I'll pause while you go watch those videos. Okay, you're back. So, like I said, this is going to be the last of the 100 level up, uh, uh, 100 level classes. This is going to be the bridge between why containers, except in this new cloud native environment, is important, and the how Kubernetes actually works. What are the components of Kubernetes? How does it do what it does? You know, how does this cloud native environment actually function? Those are going to be like two and three hundred level courses. So this is my bridge, and this bridge is really going to talk about what is Kubernetes and we've talked about containers and how they're different from VMs and all of those things. But now we're actually going to talk about what is different about Kubernetes as an orchestrator of container systems compared to what has come before. So we're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about its traits and I'm going to give you some examples. So the first trait that's sort of interesting is Kubernetes self-hosts. Kubernetes uses its own infrastructure to manage its infrastructure. It does not rely on something else. So basically the same mechanics that will run your workloads and make sure they're available and up and all of those great things that Kubernetes does is also used by Kubernetes to make sure Kubernetes itself, you know, Kubernetes views itself as really just another application in your fabric. That's what we mean by self-hosting. Two, its data model is actually a, and the API at Kubernetes, excuse me, is actually its data model. The data model in Kubernetes is aimed much more at the SRE, the DevOps community, et cetera. Where if you look at some of the more, you know, prior orchestration systems for VMs, et cetera, those APIs were meant very much to look like compute or networking or storage artifacts. You know, you stand up a VM, it has this much memory, it has a da, 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 da. In Kubernetes, the data model is more along the lines of here is a pod that makes up a, here's a container definition that makes up a service. And I want that connected into the infrastructure. I want five copies of it at least. I want it to auto scale and I want it to be front ended by a load balancer. You don't see things like create a subnet and, and or a VLAN and, and wire it into a middle box and all those things that, that you do today this is very much an operational. I want to deploy this piece of code to do something useful. And I want to think about it in those terms not in the terms of specific technologies, uh, networking specifics or storage specifics. This thing needs to store objects. This thing needs to be exposed to the outside world in a scalable manner. That is the data model in Kubernetes. The data model, and we'll get to this, in a, this is scattered throughout this, the data model represents the desired state of the infrastructure. You are saying what you want Kubernetes to actually provide and have running and make available to your users. That is what's in that database, is the desired state of the infrastructure. And the API is really just a representation of that data model. It is, it, it's not technology based. It is based on what do you want your infrastructure to be doing? What services do you want it to be providing you know, how we want it to scale, et cetera. The command and control, similarly, is again, a representation of what the world should look like. It's really just that database. Everything in Kubernetes is an independent actor and we get to something called eventual consistency rather than lockstep consistency. Kubernetes 
basically says, I need to run these pods in order to offer this service. And it's going to go tell a number of nodes saying, can you run one of these pods? And the pod node is going to say, yes, I can, or no, I can't. And if it can, Kubernetes doesn't tell the node how to run that pod or how to build that container or how to connect it to the network. It's just basically going to say, this pod needs to be connected to the, you know, this pod needs to be connected so it can be externally exposed, it needs to have this name and DNS, um, because that's what people are going to look for. Go. And the local node is then going to figure out based on the capabilities of that local node, what the best way of doing that is. So there's no big central command and control putting down specific operational step-by-step -step instructions to the rest of the Kubernetes estate. Really what's happening is each node, each component in Kubernetes is doing its own thing to try and figure out, is it aligned with what the current desired state is? And if not, what does it need to do to help come closer to that. That's called eventual consistency. If we tried to have all of the infrastructure in Kubernetes be at lockstep configuration and you needed to have send specific commands to every single component, uh, first of all, half the cluster would be taken up trying to do that, just the control plane. But secondly, it'd be very, very brittle. It really wouldn't work because when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of workloads that change by seconds or by minutes, and thousands of nodes, you will never have all of them agree. Or if you do, you're never gonna do anything because you're gonna spend all your time trying to get everyone to lockstep. Because nodes are always gonna be crashing. They're always gonna be rebooting. They're, you know, software is gonna hit issues and have to get restarted or restarted somewhere else or drives are gonna die. So there is really no way to do this. So the only way to do this is to build your system with the assumption that you will not be consistent. That at some point in time, you will have consistency or convergence. But at any given point in time, different nodes might have slightly different views of the world, and that's fine. And that's what Kubernetes does. If we tried to do the lockstep, you know, always consistent, then this would be a very brittle and very slow performing system. This is the cloud native design model, and we've talked about this a bit before. So, this is what Kubernetes does. The database is a encodes the data model, which is also the API, and that represents the desired end state at that point in time of the fact. And I've sort of hit on this already. Some cluster services are centralized, like the scheduler, like this database itself is actually sharded over multiple nodes, but it's not on all nodes. Almost everything else in Kubernetes, networking, storage, compute, uh, load balancing, TLS termination is deployed across all nodes in the infrastructure. So if any failure takes out a small piece of the infrastructure and a small bit of the capability and capacity, it doesn't take out the whole thing. So Kubernetes is a very resilient, horizontally scaled environment, which is different than what we've seen before, usually, unless you've worked in some of the hyperscalers. And the other interesting thing here, like I said before, the self-hosts, which means that the master nodes really are just there to make sure we have enough compute power to run the scheduler and that kind of stuff. If a master node dies, another node will end up taking over that function as well. You can run real workloads, right? user workloads, I should say, on the master nodes if you want to. And just we suggest you don't if you've got enough nodes because we wanna make sure that the Kubernetes control plane, that database, and the, data, the API listeners, et cetera, have the bandwidth to do what they need to do. But there is nothing special about those nodes other than that's what starts the whole ball rolling. So that's a little bit on the traits of Kubernetes. Let's talk about that desired state. Again, we're not gonna say create this VLAN, you know, hook into this load balancer, da, da, da. Basically, what this, you know, let's look at what might be in a Kubernetes desired end state database. Every node should run a CNI. Every node needs to be connected to the network. It needs to be able to connect its workloads that it hosts into the network. And that's a container network interface. We'll talk about that later. All enabled loads labeled blue, I enabled them somehow when I built them or whatever, should donate all their NVMe drives 
to an object store because I need an object store for some of my applications. There should be a minimum of five Bob service pods running at any given point in time. And if one of them dies or the node hosting it dies, you should start another Bob somewhere else. There should be two Alice service pods and those should be exposed using a load balancer to the outside world. They, they are Alice is what's gonna to talk to the outside world. So that needs to be connected to a load balancer or, or externally exposed anyway. There should be three Cindy service pods running at all times in the infrastructure, much like there are five Bobs. And the Bob service should be able to talk to the Alice service on port 80. And the Cindy pod should be able to talk to the Dave pods uh, on port 8443. So that is the desired state. There's nothing in this where you told Kubernetes exactly how to build those pods, how to connect the network, how to do anything else. You're just saying, this is what my estate should look like. So let's walk through. I'm not going to walk through all of these examples, but I'll, I'll try and highlight a couple of, of cases here. So now I'm going to go ahead and show you an eye chart that represents a Kubernetes cluster with the desired end state we just talked about installed. I'm not going to go over every single one of those cases because it's going to become somewhat repetitive, but I'm going to show you a few things and how Kubernetes goes ahead and actually effectuates or drives that eventual consistency to that desired end state. First thing we said is every Kubernetes node must run a CNI because we have to be able to network its pods into the infrastructure. So you'll notice every node should run a CNI. What Kubernetes has done is basically in each of these places, in each of these compute nodes is running something called a CNI process. Then we'll talk about what a CNI is later, but it's basically the networking stack for Kubernetes. So next, we say that all the blue nodes should take their NVMe drives and make them available for a uh, key value store. Actually, that key value store is going to be for the Kubernetes desired end state database called etcd. We'll talk again about that in a bit. And you'll see indeed that is the case that all three of the nodes that were labeled blue now have NVMe drives and those are now tied in to be the KV store for the Kubernetes API server. The next thing we said is there should be five Bob service pods that should be launched. So Kubernetes tells a number of nodes to go ahead and find the Bob service pod definition, compile its container, and launch it. And let's say four of these have done that. But now this node here tries and fails. Can't install that for some reason. It goes back, tells Kubernetes it can't install it. And guess what? Kubernetes picks another node and says, okay, install the Bob over there. Great. I'm now running five Bob nodes. Now let's say what happens next. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that in a second. The next thing that's going to happen is I've got to stand up a couple of uh, Alice uh, nodes. I need two Alice nodes, and they need to be connected to a, a, a be exposed to the outside world. And Kubernetes has been told to use its own load balancing platform or one of its in integrated load balancing platforms to do load balancing for external exposure. So it's going to, again, pick two nodes, and it's going to stand up Alice nodes on them. It could be on the same nodes as Bob's, different nodes, doesn't really matter. And it's going to stand up, in this case, something called Metal LB as a BGP load balancer um, to front end those Alice nodes. So now, a couple of things interestingly happen. One, load balancer knows that the Alice service is available by those nodes. So when any traffic comes in for the Alice service, the load balancer knows it can send those traffic, that traffic to either of the Alice nodes. And we'll talk about what happens here in a minute when that fails. Similarly, we know that Bobs are supposed to be able to talk on port 80 to the Alice nodes. So now the container networking interface implements that network policy and basically on the Alice nodes says that the Alice nodes should be willing to accept traffic from any Bob node. I'm not going to draw this for all of them because that's just going to make this screen a huge mess. 
But now that Alice node is going to accept traffic from any of those Bob nodes. And similarly, um, you know, one more just to, to make things clear. Um, same thing's happening on this Alice node. I'm not going to draw them all. So we now have this graph, service graph that's built. We didn't tell Kubernetes how to do it. We said, this is the desired end state. Bob should talk to Alice's on 80, and Alice should be able to uh, handle load balance service service works coming in. But now let's say something interesting has happened. Let's say we've had, you know, uh, this of course never happens in reality, but let's just say for sake of argument, um, service tech is in your site and he pulls the wrong cord and all of a sudden this server is gone. That server no longer exists. What's gonna happen? Well, first thing, Kubernetes is gonna notice that it's missing one Bob and one Alice pod, that it is supposed to have two Alice pods and five Bob pods. So what's it immediately gonna do? It's gonna go find homes for two more Bob and Alice pods. So let's say it decides to put another Bob pod here, and it decides to put another Alice pod here. Now, I'm not gonna actually completely erase it, but this policy link that allowed the Bob that no longer exists to talk to that Alice, or this load balancer link, or that link are erased because there is no Bob and Alice in those pods anymore. The policy is erased. This Alice will no longer accept traffic from that Bob there. This load balancer will no longer send traffic to this Alice because it doesn't exist. Instead, what's gonna happen is new policy maps get created and this Bob can now talk to this Alice. This Bob can talk to this Alice. And this Bob can talk to this Alice. And the load balancer now knows that its other load balance endpoint is this Alice, not the dead one. You didn't have to do anything. Most of these servers didn't have to do anything. Only the servers that had the old Bob and Alice or got the new Bob and Alice or where the load balancer had to reconfigure to update this. The interesting thing in Kubernetes is changes like this usually take place within less than 10 milliseconds, even across a fleet of 150,000 containers across thousands of servers. That's probably an interesting place to stop. So. Kubernetes, the key takeaway here is Kubernetes is an eventual consistency model. It All it really propagates is the desired end state of the infrastructure. All of the nodes independently configure themselves to match that desired end state based on whatever capabilities that node may or may not have. Beyond this point, we're now gonna start talking about the mechanics, how these pieces work together to give you this. You know, you start understanding what is a CNI? What is a CSI? What's a kubelet do? All of those things. We hope to hear from you, uh, see you in the next episodes. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. Um, our, my information is, is provided in this video uh, or uh, your Cisco account teams or, or whoever, and they can get back to me. And similarly, if there's anything specific that you want to hear about that I haven't talked about, please let me know uh, and I will include it in a future episode. One of the things I will probably do fairly soon is cover some security things. Uh, there's a lot of activity right now happening around security. It's a fairly advanced topic, but it's very uh, time, um, time sensitive or not necessarily time sensitive, but it's very germane to right now. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have an enjoyable rest of your day or your evening and we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.